Hey everybody, Jazzy here. Here is a recap of year seven of Thrill of the Grill, my solo Warly world over on Twitch. This autumn I wanted to really focus on the Krabby Hermit quests, which is the first step towards eventually fighting Crab King and obtaining the Celestial Tribute. First stop in that regard is returning to our salt formations and harvesting 10 cookie cutter shells, which is required for one of the Hermit's house upgrades. This is probably one of the most tedious tasks because a shell is only a 25% drop from cookie cutters, which means on average you're gonna have to kill about 40 of these asshats. You are unlikely to get that many at a single salt formation without waiting for them to reappear, but fortunately I did have a few from my first fateful visits to these demon spawn. I remember as Wirt, I waited around a salt formation for like 10 days while the cookie cutters very slowly respawned and it was not very fun. Day 432, I'm back on land hunting a koala fint for its trunk. Under normal circumstances, this would be completely useless to Warly, but I'm gonna make a breezy vest. If I'm still having issues with Pearl in winter, then I can give her some insulating body clothing while it's snowing, and that will earn me a single friendship point. Day 436, I am on her island and loaded up with maximum friendship power. Pearl starts off hating your guts, but as you do certain tasks for her, she'll slowly warm up to you and gift you these little bundles of thanks. Doing this will also unlock certain trades, such as lures, tackle boxes, and a couple of blueprints in exchange for empty bottles. We're shooting for 10 friendship points, at which point she gives you her pearl, which is the big objective. First point is going to be a house upgrade with boards and precious cookie cutter shells. Second will be the next upgrade with marble and rope. Third will be giving Hermit a flower salad. She loves these. Fourth will be the final house upgrade with moon rock and cactus flowers. Fifth will be to dry six monster meat on her drying racks. Sixth will be to kill the lure plant on the island. Seventh will be to plant 10 flowers around her bee box. And the eighth will be to plant and fertilize eight berry bushes. I was anticipating having to wait until winter to give Hermit the puffy vest for the ninth point, but it's end of autumn, so we can actually go back home, craft an umbrella, and sail back and give it to her while it's raining. I'm so glad I made a puffy vest. Maybe I could deconstruct it and feed the trunk to Cheesecake the Vargling. For the tenth and final friendship point, I'm gonna grab the Pinch and Winch blueprint from Hermit and craft a boat with one so that I can clean up all the underwater trash around her island. I was hoping to avoid this because it's a really annoying task, but it's probably less annoying than fishing for five heavy ocean fishes. Pearl obtained. Time to sail home for winter. Day 444, I'm building my Terra Firma Tamper. I don't like digging up turf in bulk because it's boring as hell, so if I need a few pieces of a certain turf, I'm gonna try and rely on this over traveling around with my pitchfork. Some of the recipes are really cheap, so it will be faster to craft those turfs versus gathering. And rocky turf, I'm going to make so much from here. My chest zone is finally complete! 144 chests and 12 scaled chests. That's about 480 boards. Now you know why I am relentless with tree farming, but the awful truth is I'm gonna eventually spend more on cobblestone. So consider this the warm up round for tree farming. Day 446, we got a laser clops. I only had a single bone armor, so I kited around while it was on cooldown. It was good to practice the kiting pattern because it's different from the usual deer clops. When you're dodging, you should move at an angle to avoid the laser attack. If he's gonna smash down, then you have this extra second to move further back, but the laser is really fast, so you should already be moving sideways by then. Claws dead, day 448. Still no sack. The curse is a meme at this point. We got two festive lights and a mandrake, so it's still very much worth it. Day 450, I'm gathering reeds in the swamp to make gift wrap. The gift bundles are basically these one-use bundling wraps that store up to four items and prevent food spoilage. You don't need to prototype them in Winter's Feast, but you do need to prototype the papyrus. Make sure to craft one of these during Winter's Feast, even if you normally use bundles, because you'll still have the recipe after the event ends. 
This is true for all event-specific recipes. Middle of spring, I get a frog rain, so I try to bring them over to D-Fly. It's a little tricky getting her to aggro on a frog. Basically, you gotta wait for a frog to hop over to D-Fly and lick her once. That'll get her to start swiping, and all the other frogs will join in. The problem is the same problem I had with the Rook versus Deerclops. The fact that boss mobs almost always prioritize players over other mobs, even when they're getting damaged by them. So in order to keep Dragonfly from attacking me after killing a frog, I need to stand way back from the fight. It's doable, but just tricky to gather up the frog legs when it's all done. Anyways, now that we've got a grip of frog legs, I can start mass producing Fish Cordon Blue, an amazing Warly exclusive recipe that provides complete wetness immunity for 5 minutes. I was saving up my fish meat from the Malbatross Shoal for this very purpose, because I can do one large fish for the recipe. I imagine I'll be using this dish a lot for longer boss fights, where I might want to stay protected from the rain while fighting a wet mob with Volt Goat Jelly. Day 466, I'm finishing up a revamp of this crop zone. It was in need of some serious fixing. The grass I'm still using to try and spawn geckos, and once I get what I consider to be enough of them, I will transplant all the grass tufts to right outside the pen, and this will let me harvest the grass without fear of spawning more geckos. I'm thinking I will then fill this plot with stone fruit bushes. One unique thing about the gingerbread fence skin is that it has a front and a back, and for this build I learned that for the way I usually orient my camera, the back of that fencing actually looked really nice. I wish there were more structures that had different sides to them, I think it's a really cool concept. Day 467, I'm running the Bunnyman fire farm, but it starts raining just as I light the fuse. And this is not good because the fire will spread slower to the other tufts, and the bunnies are going to take much longer to die. I should have just stopped, but I tried multiple rounds of burning, and I accidentally burned a grass tuft. Lesson learned though, I should really not run this farm in spring at all. Day 471, I get a nice spring claws fight in, and I'm able to benefit from the Volt Goat Jelly with 2.5 times the damage. The whole fight lasted a little shy of 3 minutes. I've heard of Mighty Wolfgang taking him down in about 30 seconds with Spicy Jelly, and I definitely believe it. The spring sack was a bit of a bust though, but we did get one Festive Light and another goddamn Mandrake. On that note, one of the hidden benefits of playing as Warly is that I can't accidentally eat mandrakes in my inventory. Did you see that misclick right there? Night shift flashbacks, anyone? I swear I cannot keep these things in my inventory. They always inevitably end up in my mouth. So let's see, now we got the mandrake, the twig, the curse of the sack. Jazzy memes are growing by the day. Around the end of spring, I'm doing my first D-Fly fight since getting a second bone armor. I'm just tanking and swapping for this one just to see how much nightmare fuel I end up using. It cost about 14 nightmare fuel with a full handbat. So if I were smacking her down with dark swords to make the fight quicker, then I need a little more than 4 dark swords worth of damage. That's 20 nightmare fuel. I think I'm just gonna do this from now on. It's a quicker fight, lower resource cost, and no need to focus on kiting. It's definitely cheesy, but I kind of feel like I've earned the equipment needed, so I'm content to just do the fight and farm the drops without stressing the preparation every single time. If a viewer wants to see the kiting strat, then I'm glad to demonstrate for a future fight, but otherwise, I'm probably just going to treat her like Deerclops. Last day before summer, I'm planting the birch nut trees, and this time I'm going big. 320 seeds. It won't even put a dent in our cobblestone needs, but it'll be a good start. Summer, I wanted to stay upstairs and do some farming, so we're gonna kill Antlion right away and then plant some seeds. I don't have the right seeds to do any summer giant crops yet, so I'm planting this batch of generic seeds and hoping to get some of the crops that I need. You do have a better chance of getting crops when they are in season, so it's always a good place to start. If you tend and water as much as possible, then you have a much better shot at getting multiple seeds, which will speed up the early part of this process. There's always a chance to get a weed from a generic seed, but I don't think weeds randomly pop out of the ground in summer or winter, so it's easier to keep on top of the weeding during these seasons. After the first harvest, I finally get some garlic, which I can plant next to pepper and onion 
for what's arguably Warley's best combo of nutrient balanced crops. The second planting is not going to be giant because I don't yet have four of each, but they will still fertilize each other and I can get more seeds because of that. I'm going to want garlic because it can be planted in any season and it restores tons of nutrients back into the soil. While those are growing, I'm going to throw some tomatoes and peppers into the other plot in a 2 to 1 ratio. This will provide another balanced combo that will self-fertilize as they grow. This is important to remember though. Make sure they have enough nutrients as seeds. One thing that I have not seen mentioned anywhere about these crops is that they only restore nutrients if they consume them. Meaning, if they don't have nutrients at the very beginning, then they won't be producing after the first phase and they automatically get a stress point. And this can cascade into future cycles where the plants don't get what they need from each other. So it's important to prime the farm plot in the first stage and just make sure they're happy until they start producing for each other. Day 487, we get our first giant tomatoes and peppers. And first day of autumn, we get our first batch of giant onions and garlic. I think I'm getting the hang of this. Looking forward to stockpiling onions for all of Warley's dishes and grinding the pepper and garlic into seasoning. This update was so amazing for Warley. That's it for year seven. Next time, we're gonna smash those trees and then go smash claws, fuel weaver, and toadstool. And then it'll be time to set up our spider farm. I hope you're enjoying these recap videos. Just a friendly reminder that all of the past broadcasts can be found on the playlist titled Solo Warley Twitch World that you can access from the channel homepage. Thanks for watching, and maybe next time you can join us live on Twitch. Take care.